played our I played our live video right over the intro. That's all good. So, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Madam <laughs> Luke's. My name is Sim. Along with me are is my co-host, the one and only Sheikh Hamer. Assalamu alaikum. The other guys flaked out today. It's all good. We'll Didn't flake them. out. We'll forgive them. We kind of we kind of told them. But we got a guest tonight. He's a special person dear to our heart, Dr. Ali Harfush. Sorry. Sir Ali Harfush. I have this thing about he's he's just such a bright person in my mind. So I just I remember the last time you kept you kept on calling Doctor Ali Harfush. He had to correct you. Get on like a lot. Honestly, uh, it's really a pleasure having you, brother. I was telling Sim before the show that uh, it is uh, every time we get together with you, it's very blessed, man. Alhamdulillah. So Allah, we, ask Allah all accept, we, act, uh, we ask Allah to accept, and we all Ameen. love you for the sake of Allah, man. I mean, I mean, Sheikh Hamer has been uh, on a diet recently. Okay. Dr. Ali. Let's talk Ali. about him, dude, please. <laughs> Let's not you, talk about no, me. He might want to know. He does a 72 hour intermittent fast. So oh if he's God. not, um, you God, know, all I'm there so sorry. with his senses, do you ever do a fast that long? No, no. Know. He doesn't need to, bro. No? He's fit, bro. Yeah, well, I don't need to. You, I'm, you, I'm never, <laughs> you never know. What if she was like a very overweight person like a year ago or a few years ago? And he just lost a whole lot of weight. You can't judge a book by its cover, Sheikh. <laughs> Anyways. Imagine if Ali was a really big guy. <laughs> I can't yeah. imagine that, but I think yeah. that you're just imagining you. <laughs> Look at him scratching his face. He's like, what am I doing here? <laughs> no, no, no. Anyways, Bismillah, man. Let's, let's, uh, we got so a very special individual. The, yeah, we got to get this. He wrote an, uh, he, Ali wrote an amazing article. Uh, article about the places or the the Muslim left and the Muslim right. Yeah, well, remember I was telling you even before this, I was like, you know, and obviously this is from Allah, man. But I said, how does he fit so much information in such a small piece? Yeah, right. And that's tofiq from Allah. And we're gonna obviously unravel all of this today, inshallah, for you all. But this is uh, this is something I've always wanted to construct. I was never able to do it. So I'm just letting you know, and I'm letting the listeners know, this is going to, there's going to be a mega sharh on this. There's going to be a huge explanation on this. Um, I, I, I really am going to use this uh, as a foundation for ex explaining a lot of, just the just the, uh, the political spectrum with Muslims in the West, you know? Yeah. So uh, the article is in the episode description, uh, whether you're on YouTube or the podcast. Uh, you'll be able to click on the the link and be able to read the article himself, yourself. But we're going to basically kind of do an overview of, about some of the different things that he, Ali brought up in the article that we should examine. And um, it's it's basically talking about what Muslim identity is in the West and uh, where where do we belong belong on the spectrum or do we even belong on the spectrum at all? Mm -hmm. We're not talking. Yeah, where do we find ourselves? Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are we subjugated to something? Are we are we putting ourselves in that? position right i like how it's uh in essence liberating muslims to letting them understand giving you an overview a, a very detailed overview and letting them know um you know you have a choice and uh we're going to get into those choices inshallah yeah so uh but what, what was your initial thought about writing this article ali so originally what i wanted to try to do was um criticize this idea that Muslims are bound between the left and between the right, that there are no certain possibilities or or choices beyond this dichotomy between, you know, aligning ourselves with the left or aligning ourselves with the right. So I kind of wanted to depack that idea, to unpack the problems of limiting ourselves to the left or, or to the right. Mm. And how long did it, I know this sounds a little cheesy, but how long... Did, was this whole process have you been thinking about it for a while and then you wrote it now or it's just you know you just thought about it a little bit ago and you it took you a, you know whatever amount of time to write it i mean as a muslim living in the united states this is something that i've been thinking about for a while um but i finally decided to put it on pen and paper um with this article and inshallah i have a, another article coming up which is more specific to um muslims in america Mm -hmm. And the title of the article is The Idea of America is Dead. So in these two articles, um, the one that you're the one that we're discussing today, 
and the future article, um, the idea of America is dead. I'm trying to kind of articulate where do Muslims fit in to um, politics in the West. Hmm. So um, let, let's start things off and, and uh, look at how or where you you um, what were some of the conclusions you came out with and uh, when you when you first determine or you started off the the, the article you're talking about that the definitions of the um, the debate are not set out for us we're basically kind of being pigeonholed into a bunch of different uh, characteristics and uh, ideas that are related to the left ideology or the or the, the right wing ideology in America, and mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about that and what you came away with. So one of the things I'm trying to think through and try to articulate is why is it that Muslims feel as though they are confined to prepackaged uh, tribes, which is the left wing and between the right wing. So what sort of uh, cognitive factors operate when we limit ourselves to the left and uh, uh, to the right? And how is power related to limiting us to the left and to the right? What does it mean to be able to think about alternative conceptions of power? What does it mean to think of Islam as not existing on the left and right spectrum, but existing on its own as an independent and autonomous course of action and as an autonomous vision, not only for Muslims in the West, but for Muslims in the global North and in the global South. So what does it mean to think as an ummah, as opposed to thinking as belonging to the liberal or left-wing camp or belonging to the conservative camp? So what possibilities are inaugurated? What certain um, futures are inaugurated when you begin to think beyond the left and think beyond the right? And is it possible to do so? So in this article, I'm trying to argue that it is most certainly possible to do so, and that we do have the capacity, we do have the choice to think beyond these two tribes. How though? That's what a lot of people say. Well, Ali, it's these are nice uh, uh, platitudes to have where we look at, you know, we wanna create our own uh, political uh, wing or some kind of uh, identity, Muslim-based identity, uh, Muslim-based party that uh, that is based on Islam and its ideas, but it's not going to make any traction in a modern world. How would you respond to that person? I think, if anything, actually the opposite is true. I think this whole idea of a left wing and then a right wing are becoming less and less tasteful uh, to Muslims. So there is this emergence of a global political consciousness where Muslims are beginning to affiliate themselves more and more with the Ummah. And not only the Ummah as a spiritual bond, but the Ummah as a political bond. And, you know, this is actually one of the things, there's a um, there's an analyst with the Rand Corporation, and he was actually warning that there's this new emerging trend, which he calls Ummatitis, right? For him, for him, this idea of the Ummah is, is, is cancerous, to American politics and to imperial politics. So I think that not only is it possible, but we're already witnessing the emergence of alternative ways of thinking about identity. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially the idea of an ummah, belonging to an ummah, as opposed to belonging to some, as opposed to falling somewhere along the political spectrum. So what I wanted to try to do was, okay, what does it mean to think as an ummah? And I have a article coming up in Ta'ala on Omarik's Colloquium, where I discuss in detail, uh, well, in some detail, what it means to think as an Ummah in terms of autonomous thought and autonomous action. Yeah, well, before we get to that, uh, you're, uh, you're on the ball about, right on the mark about how Muslims uh, in general, there's an attitude developing. I think I would argue that it's also among non-Muslims that they don't want to be associated with just the left or the right, that there is some kind of blend that they agree with the, the right wing on, let's just say, the Second Amendment, whereas uh, they'll agree with the, uh, the left on other issues related mm. to whatever they're passionate about. Mm. But um, suffice it to say, I think there's been a, a discontent among general Americans 
where people don't want to identify specifically or wholeheartedly with one one side mm. i mean i know right now among uh, there are look americans are, are a very large group of people there are you're going to see in at least mainstream media and whatnot or, or movies and arts and theater you're going to see all those people who will always be loved you know but i i think as you see like this new uh, brand of uh, american uh, identity that's being developed at least if you look at read a lot of the or, or watch a lot of different podcasts like joe rogan or um uh, jordan peterson etc there's like a bunch of um, different ideas that are being mm. kind of put together and they're from uh, you know from the right and from the left so yeah. how do you feel about that as well maybe muslims can perhaps offer in, in a, a solution or some kind of idea not just for muslims but also for non-muslims in in, in the west mm -hmm. definitely i think one 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 very interesting trend that as muslims we need to pay very careful attention to is that uh americans are losing hope not only americans but even in western europe right they're losing hope and they are finding themselves increasingly um disenchanted with the left-right spectrum mm. right so that's why we have the rise of populism, Trumpism, and radical left-wing politics uh, in the United States and uh, across the Western world. So I think this provides an ideal opportunity for Muslims to intervene and to articulate, okay, what are alternative um, identity structures? What are alternative visions? What are alternative um, frameworks uh, for understanding global politics? And for understanding what are the possibilities that lay in front of us um, beyond the left-right tribe. Well, uh, one of the most common things, at least if we we're looking at a Venn diagram of the different ideas between the left, the right, and and everything in the middle, is that they all center around or or all encapsulated under this uh, nationalist um, uh, tribe mentality. And how mm -hmm. how does Islam kind of formulate this new vision of the world where we we encourage citizens of the world and people in general to look beyond their their ethnicity and their, their their tribe and that they need to you know have a much larger vision than mm -hmm. other themselves and their locality mm -hmm. that, definitely so so one of the things that distinguishes islam from other alternative uh political prospects is the fact that Islam is autonomous, right? So Islam has an independent intellectual framework, and it also charts for the Muslims and for the Ummah an alternative course of action, right? This is actually inherent in the very word Ummah, which connotates a direction, which means to head towards something. Uh, as a noun, the word Ummah means a destination. So inherent in the very idea of the Ummah as having an image of the self is this idea of autonomy that Muslims can and should um, chart their own course of action in the world, in a world that's becoming increasingly disenchanted, like I said, with um, with these two tribes. So this is a moment for Muslims to intervene strategically, not only in, in the United States, but on a global level, precisely because Islam demands of Muslims a kind of global thinking rather than a nationalistic or a tribal mode of thinking. Um, I wanted to mention something really quickly from the article, if you don't mind. Um, you had said, and this is very, I think, very important. I would like to read a lot more, but because of time. Uh, you said, I want to discuss how our alignment with the left and the right amounts to a cruel optimism, right? Um, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate when you say a cruel optimism, right? Just so we can start kind of deconstructing the idea of the right and the left for Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. Just to dissect it for them. What is this cruel optimism? Why is it a cruel optimism? So, so um, an optimistic attachment is cruel when the object of desire, in this case representation in media and government, becomes an obstacle to uh, what brought us to it in the first place. So in this case, the object of desire that is cruel is Muslim representation. 
Now, why is it a cruel attachment? Because what ends up happening is that the Muslim loses himself. The Muslim self is lost in the very process of trying to seek out representation. Hmm. And I explain this because in when we try to seek out representation in the left camp, left wing camp, the liberal camp, or even in terms of postmodern identities, uh, postmodern affiliations, what we end up doing is reducing Islam to a social construct. Islam is reduced to an opinion. And when we try to align ourselves with the uh, the right wing and the conservative camp, similarly, Islam is reduced to a cultural icon mm. rather than being an autonomous force of action and so forth. So it is cruel optimism because in pursuing representation um, in government and media, we end up foregoing power uh, because we are lost in the process. The Muslim self is lost in the process of trying to seek out representation. Yes. And you mentioned uh, something, you know, like, um, and I, I personally believe this, you know, um, while seeking representation, you make Islam just a cultural identity marker, right? That's mm -hmm. what it ends up becoming. And you mentioned something to that degree. The wording you kind of used is that, for instance, hijab just becomes a exercising of freedom, but there's no basically vertical relationship there and that you can demonstrate to the world which what mm -hmm. it's supposed to be. For instance, I'm just using that as a small example that you used. But this representation and losing your identity and, and representation, I think this is something that generally Muslims think in the West that this is just, it's just a part of the process because it's all we have. Yeah. So when you tell them, you know, there's a Muslim candidate, for instance, whether it's for Congress or whether it's for whatever, um, you see that they had a certain lifestyle before they were a candidate and then they start doing certain things and Muslims there's either two or three camps right like there's two or three camps generally one will say hey this is just a part of it this is what we have to do we don't have a choice which is your point they gave up hope completely and they they're limiting themselves to just these two camps the right and the left the others will say that hey he's not an Islamic candidate he's just a Muslim candidate you don't expect him to do anything Islamic he's just a Muslim guy so we should support him yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, for me, that question is, if he's just a Muslim guy, then why do you? I mean, if it's not anything Islamic and he's just a Muslim guy and if he's not qualified, are you just choosing him because he's Muslim? Because if you're choosing because he's Muslim, it should be something at least a little Islamic, right? Or holding out to the Islamic principles. Mm -hmm. Right. So it always seemed like a contradiction to me. And the third is obviously, man, you're, we're doing something great and you're destroying it. Right. Uh, you know, so that that's what I've usually seen with people that try to go through this process and in the process of seeking representation, they diminish everything about their Islam, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you, based on what I just mentioned, you, you also uh, mentioned that Muslims, we have something which is an alternative, right? But there's a process that has to be built within like the people. So how would you, Respond. Someone says, okay, yeah, you're right. So how do we start this process of, you know, alleviating ourselves psychologically from this right or the left? What has to take place? Okay. So first of all, let me just um, kind of touch on something that you mentioned. I think we need to differentiate between two, two modes of politics. So you have, uh, I like to distinguish between Muslim politics and Islamic politics. Mm. So Muslim politics is this ambiguous sense of um, Muslimness, right? But it is a politics where our values and our, our discourse and our narratives don't necessarily represent or emanate from an Islamic framework. Hmm. Um, whereas Islamic politics is a politics that emanates from Islam, that emanates from an Islamic hierarchy of values and so forth. So what we witness in the West when Muslims try to enter the political spectrum is a Muslim politics rather than um, an Islamic politics. Now, um, Carl Schmitt, a um, brilliant political philosopher, makes this very important point. He says that the high point of politics, the high point of politics, to the, the very ability to exist in the political space rests on the ability to differentiate between the self and between the other. He uses the words friend and enemy. Hmm. Now, unless you are able to differentiate the self, let's say in this case, the Muslim self from the other, in, in our case, 
uh, the right wing or the left wing camp, we are inevitably absorbed into other political orders. So when, when we want to begin to think about, okay, what is the first step towards escaping the political spectrum? The first step is demarcating Islam and Muslims from the other. And this means identifying what are our commitments? What is our hierarchy of values? What is our intellectual framework? And what is our strategic vision? Hmm. If we do not articulate these, then as Schmidt points out, we are inevitably absorbed into the other, into an existing um, political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the reasons Muslims have been unable to think beyond these two tribes is because power operates in a very subtle way. So generally, when we think about power, we think about violence. But the reality is that power does not just operate through violence. Power also operates through ideas. Power also operates by creating a space for action and then limiting the agent to that space of action. And the, the metaphor that comes to mind is, if, is the cat and the mouse. Mm -hmm. I love this example. Um, so there's this one uh, German scholar who uses the example. He says, if you ever look at the way a cat and a mouse um, the way a cat uh, 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 traps the mouse is that you'll notice that it doesn't immediately inflict violence, right? It doesn't immediately try to capture it or to take it within its uh, 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 within its teeth or whatever. What it does first is it creates a space that and it allows the mouse to to play in that space, right? And it just watches it, and the mouse is under the illusion that it's free. Hmm. Right. So it's only after creating that space of play, right, that then the cat inflicts violence on the mouse. And it's the same thing we do with our children. Right. If our children want to go outside, we say, OK, you can play in the backyard. Right. So they have this illusion of freedom. But in reality, they are working within a demarcated space that we create for them. So so this is how power operates in with Muslims in the West. Right. The left wing and the right wing create these illusionary spaces of action and thinking, right? And it creates the illusion of freedom, where in reality, um, it is anything but freedom. Yes. And obviously, when you say it's anything but freedom, because it's making you realize that your deen and what you've learned, uh, I'm just talking about on just, on just a higher level to a lower level, just on, on a more, mm -hmm. if you want to call it a spiritual level, right? It's uh, giving you the reason to denounce Allah in your affairs because this is for the world. You have to do something what is relatable and relative to this world, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and this is, I think, what we're referring to is when we say in this process of representation, you end up withering away with yourself and your principles of Iman mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. now for you, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a necessity. I have to do it type thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's paved in good. It's paved in good intentions and good heart, right? Yeah. But yeah, that cat and mouse example is yeah. That's that's kind of scary, man. Because when I think about that kind of stuff, when it's people feel so, you see joy on Muslims' faces when they have some type of representation as if this is it. This was our goal, right? And you see their faces; they're so happy. And then you kind of, you know, you wait for obviously a moment to later to talk to them about it, but you just feel really bad because. This is what their standard is. This is what their vision is. There's nothing else. Yeah, I mean, if, when you see uh, a Muslim politician, uh, you know, gay pride parade, you know. Oh, he has to do it. Yeah, I mean, he that's has what, to do it, man. What, what <laughs> are you living in a cave, Sheikh Hammer? This is what this is what you have to do. Well, the right wing doesn't do it. They don't. They don't. You're right. So why are you, why are you so willing to compromise your Islam when the right wing isn't? compromising their values it's almost mm -hmm. as if no and i agree with you and uh, uh brother ali i'll let you say something i just don't want to forget what what i realized with conversations with a lot of brothers and sisters regarding this is their catapult into politics is coming from a place of being inferior in the first place mm -hmm. and they're showing their own inferiority to everybody else because they feel that they have to latch on to those things that are going to help them and save them, even though deep down inside they deep down inside they hate it. So when somebody tells me that they want political representation or they're, it kind of shows me like 
their weakness. Do you yeah. understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I don't, am I making sense? It's it's yes. almost as if yeah. it's a reaction to their weakness, and they this is in it's a display of you know um, of their weakness, I guess. But go ahead, Ali. Yeah, I mean this is this is again precisely one of the reasons we've fallen into this pitfall is because we don't really understand how power operates. So when you don't know how power operates, you end up leaving the power structures intact rather than trying to change them. So Muslims in the United States and Muslims in the West, when they try to seek out political participation, what they are doing essentially is they are seeking out a a uh, a redistribution of power that leaves the power structures intact rather than thinking about alternative forms of power. And by alternative forms of power, I mean independent thought and independent courses of action. And, you know, inherent in power, uh, the operation of power is also future making. So, and this is the case with Muslims in, in the West, when we seek our representation, not only is our present colonized and occupied, but also our future is colonized and occupied. So we are unable even to think about alternative futures precisely because power has colonized our future, our future thinking, and our capacity to think about alternative visions. So one of the high point of, 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 of secular power, for example, is its ability to domesticate the Muslim, to domesticate the Muslim into this sort of eternal present that he thinks is, is natural or just the way things are. And the Muslims' inability to think about alternative visions or alternative futures. Hmm. Uh, some people will say, um, you know, Sim, this is this is fine, but it's much more simpler than that. These are people just want to. People have this proclivity to, um, you know, drop their their existing ideas, and they want to uh, blend in with the majority of. Uh, of a population, and um, we're 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 trying to we're um, getting too granular about uh, or digging too deep into this. But when it's a fairly simple concept, and I'm, I don't think it's from at least from that argument's perspective, I think they're right. It is a simple concept, but I think there's a lot main, a lot of different forces at play here, where people need to understand that your your these are like the principles of how societies are structured. And when when Muslims were at, at the top, for example, when they had their own state or the, the Khilafah of the past, there were uh, non-Muslims who wanted representation. They would have to play by the uh, the rules and the norms of the, the government systems back then, mm-hmm. and they would be absorbed and ingested into the Islamic framework. Yeah. Right, so it wor- these are like principles of all governance, of governance, yeah. and of uh, of how societies are kind of regulated, right, uh, mm-hmm. Ali? Yeah, I think I, I'm not sure if the initial statement I made was um, related to what I just said, but what I'm what I'm trying to understand is that do when when we're talking to the average layman, we're trying to explain to them this. They're not thinking like us. They're thinking the immediate term. Well, Sim, right now we're getting uh, oppressed. We're pe- we don't have representation. People, um, sisters are being uh, told to take off their hijab, or um, we're losing our identity if we don't do this because we're in a, we don't have representation. People are are oppressing us, and you're saying that by getting involved with you, we're, we're still losing our identity. So there's there's that argument as well that sometimes we're also faced with that mm. if we don't get involved, we're like for example in India, you you heard about the the hijab ban that they're mm-hmm. experiencing. But from what I know, at least I think one of the the, the justices on the on that uh, on the final ruling committee, he was a Muslim too. So out of the three judges, there was one of them was a judge. So I don't know what the representation in India brought them. Right, hmm. but anyway, mm-hmm. well, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think you know you made you made a very important point, which is that the starting point for Muslims seeking out representation is Muslims occupying the lower hand, right? And one of the ways in which uh, the empire 
Pax Americana or American politics operates is by putting Muslims constantly on the defensive uh, against being homophobic, against extremism, and so forth. So what this leads to is this slow, very slow but subtle erosion of Muslim identity, right? Um, and when your identity is being eroded slowly and you are constantly on the defensive, then it is only natural that you will seek out a redistribution of power rather than trying to change the structures of power or think beyond the existing structures of power. But you mentioned a few things. Do you think people still kind of think like, like I think um, the conversations I probably had with, let's just say anyone from 15 to 30 years old, maybe 25, 30 years old, right? Just in that age group. I don't think that anyone has even really conversed with them about political representation being Muslim. Like the, 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 the newer generation, I think, thinks very differently. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think they don't even care. Like a lot. I'm not, I'm just, obviously, there's pockets of people that. Well, they pretend, are, uh, at least from the younger generations, there's the, the uh, woke left ideology that many young Muslims are kind of have aligned themselves to. I don't see, although we see among friends and stuff, we see, you know, a few people who are more right wing inclined or oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see that. I, I see the far, far more Muslims being associated with left wing politics and um, things like critical race theory and uh, yeah. you know identity politics and activism in that in that sphere. But are they are they even because I, I don't I almost feel like I'm almost losing touch. But are they concerned about um, just like Islamic legality of like being a part of any type of no, left they, or right they don't, they, don't even, they don't even operate from that framework right? right Ali like I think we, a lot of the way it just we, is yeah I think I don't I don't think they look at it from the, the lens that we do where we're saying we have to look at what um, you know Islam says about any situation before we get involved with it I don't think that's how they operate they they're like it's some ambiguous uh, sense of good and moral morality and compassion and and that's just that and they've kind of transposed that onto islam Mm -hmm. and say hey the left and islam share these two uh these two uh, yeah you know um unidentifiable things they i doubt they can really even identify or explain what islam is to begin with nor can they even identify what their uh, woke left ideology is that's based on some kind of compassionate um, yeah. center that they're operating from. They can't even identify that, and it's just um, when when you talk to them, you, you a lot of these things start coming out where ideas are just conflicting with each other, and yeah. and things don't make sense. And then you see them getting frustrated, and they'll walk out on you or. Because they don't, they didn't really think things, think things through mm. far enough to see that, oh, a lot of my ideas are actually in conflict with each, with each other, mm. and I haven't really flushed them out. So, ha- have you seen that too, Ali? Yeah, definitely. And I think I think one of the reasons why there is this state of confusion and disarray uh, in the Muslim world, and especially with Muslims in the West, is that uh, the simple fact that Islam is not permitted to enter the public space. Why? Because if Islam is to enter the public space, it must conform to certain liberal precepts, right? So one of the things that we fail to recognize is that the the public space that we are operating within is not a neutral space like secularism likes us to think, right? It is an ideological space that excludes certain voices And that excludes Islam, Islam as an alternative political model. Now, in the absence of Islam from the political space and by limiting ourselves to the existing political spectrum, then it's only natural that there's going to be confusion, right? Because there's no alternative vision and there's no alternative course of action. And when you try to articulate an alternative course of action and an alternative vision, you're deemed to be radical. Because you're not conforming to the mainstream, right? So I think one of 
an essential step in, in recognizing the problem with representation is recognizing the fact that the so-called public space is a secular space that excludes normative forms of Muslim representation, autonomous forms of Muslim representation, and tries to limit us to two existing tribes, both of which exist in the public space because they are secular, right? Mm -hmm. So only in our ability to think beyond the secular, beyond the public space, then we can think about, okay, what are certain possibilities that that exist? What are, what are certain alternatives? Yes. So uh, one, another thing that uh, I would like, you know, to get your idea on is, um, when, when some, when you, when similar ideas are mentioned to, to people, they say, um, you know, this situation that we're in right now, my priority is to make sure that we have Muslim representation. Mm -hmm. And this is our priority. Your priority may be something else, but my priority. So I have to climb up this ladder because this mm -hmm. is what needs to be done. So what you're actually, um, you know, um, alluding to in this article of yours, this piece, is that we need to find something alternative. But mm -hmm. where do we where where are we even supposed to start? Because the structure is already made. It's a it's a colossal structure that needs to be followed. We're the free uh, you know, we're we're the leaders of the free world. And we have this structure set up. Why why would you tell us now that this is something that can't be done? It's too late to do anything else. Right? This is what we have to follow because these are what the rules are. Right? Mm -hmm. And if if you have something alternative, like we want to hear, like and that's what people say to you, right? You probably already heard people say this. I want to hear right now. They expect you to summarize everything in three minutes, right? But I want to hear right now what your alternative is, because you were saying alternative, and I mean I'm pretty sure someone's already said this to you. So, so what I'm trying to say is that number one, how do we answer that when someone says this is my priority, and I need Muslims need my representation, or our representation? No one's doing it, so. I have to do this, right? And because mm -hmm. there's a certain structure that's up. And secondly, if there is an alternative, I need a detailed understanding what this alternative to measure it to what we have right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think, I mean, what you just said expresses part and parcel of just how hegemonic and just how powerful secular ideology has become. It becomes impossible for us to think about alternative futures. And the very word representation becomes occupied. Mm. It is occupied by the secular space. So we are unable to think about representation beyond the secular space. Now the question becomes, and this is why it's cruel optimism, what is the point of seeking out Muslim representation if you cannot speak as a Muslim, but you must speak as a liberal or as a conservative and so forth? Bro, we, so just, want Muslim, we just don't want people to call Muslims is you know homophobes we don't want muslims to be scrutinized that's why we need political presentation representation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course i mean again and this is this this comes back to the issue of um um are there alternative forms of representation right is it possible to think about alternative courses of action and alternative visions and i think one of the things that islam does and this is the revolutionary nature of islam is that it demands of the ummah, it demands of the Muslims an alternative vision, right? And again, this goes back to what it be, what it means to belong to an ummah. An ummah, by definition, is a community that has a direction and that has a distinct image of itself, right? What was the second clause in the Medinian uh, constitution? In Muslimun ummatan min dun nas, that the Muslims are an, are an ummah, they are a community independent of others. So Islam in and of itself demands of us thinking about alternatives. Now, one of the reasons it's been difficult to do so is because the leadership, Muslim leadership in the United States has been unable to articulate these visions. So what we are in need of, we are in need of a Malcolm X, right? Somebody who can think about representation as, as emerging from the grassroots level, right? Uh, 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 representation emerging from the Muslim self rather than from the compromised Muslim self. So the crisis is not just a crisis of power, it's a crisis of leadership. That in the absence of truly visionary leadership, we're going to find ourselves inevitably bound by political representation on on secular terms rather than on our own terms. Hmm. 
you know, I had somebody say that this is actually really interesting. You know, like, look, they were giving Malcolm X as an example. And this person, they said, yeah, but look, you got assassinated. That was his answer. Mm -hmm. But look, you got to say, I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. Yeah, but so the thing is that, and the reason I'm saying that, it sounds funny, but um, what you're what you're asking for, Ali Harfush, is a, uh, it's not an easy path. It's a very, very difficult path to develop an alternative. Number one, who's going to develop this and who has the right to say it's correct? That's one of the things that will be asked, right? The mm -hmm. second is if they say who has the right to be asked, you know, there's something is expected to be readily available. Number two is um, there's th th that's open to being, you know, having a target on your back. Nobody's going to like this. Muslims don't want to make that sacrifice. We're already here. We est we're established. We've done everything we can to be established here. And look, we're taking small steps. We don't want to take big, big steps. First, we just want to be recognized. We want to have, you know, high elevated positions. And then change will come, inshallah, you know? That's that's general mindset, Yeah, right? I mean, I that's an important po point that Sheikh brought up, is that right now, we don't... Some of those kind of uh, groups or, or political movements, um, uh, even from Muslims, would naturally occur if there were... The, con the correct conditions in a society were in place. For example, if... Society was f facing mass unemployment, starvation, or you know economic crises, where people are having to be forced to look for a alternative, rather than um, being told. You know, when you when you, when you're being told to put something on the line, um, be somewhat of a of a of an outsider to what is ha actually happening within the modern political landscape you're 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 risking you're putting something at rest especially right? if you're affluent your community's affluent yeah so so let's just say even in order for those uh, those things to take place or take foothold in a society you need those the correct conditions to kind of take place maybe you you can argue that that it, those conditions don't need to to take place and, and please please feel free to to stop me but i really feel that until some things go wrong, until this house of cards really falls within um, modern, the modern world, you know, just the way that the economic system is based on all this debt and uh, you're seeing some of the skyrocketing inflation mm -hmm. that's happening right now with wages being unable to keep up with the inflation. When these things start amounting and this whole house falls, I think those conditions are more ripe for a message like what we're kind of talking about where we offer an alternative to the, the garbage that the left and the right bring and you can say hey look this is our, what our faith teaches here's something that you'll like about it and he, um, you're, you'll tell the left that here's something you like about it and then you'll tell the right that here there's some things that you'll like about it as well mm. what do you think about that Ali? So I think uh, this, I mean, this, what you're saying basically reflects this sense among Muslims that they are unable to create conditions for the articulation of their own vision, right? That we are bound by the conditions that are imposed on us by the secular world or the Pax Americana by the American empire. Yeah. So one of the essential steps in Muslim empowerment and in true Muslim representation is begin to think, beginning to think about how do we go about creating the conditions that are fruitful and that are suitable for articulating Islamic visions and Islamic courses of action. So this goes back to the question, okay, who creates the conditions for who, right? Who creates the conditions for who? Um, and so I, th that's one. The second thing is, I think it's important for us to recognize something, that this the world that we occupy, the world that we live in, right, is not a natural, inevitable progression of the way things are. We live under the auspices of a very distinctly secular order. And that secular order, in my opinion, is beginning to crumble. In particular, this idea of the American project that is expressed in the left and in the right. So the very idea of an American future, America as a global archetype, the very idea of secularity is beginning to crumble. 
So if you look at, for example, some of the narratives that are coming out of the Christian camps in the United States, you have this idea that we can no longer seek out representation in government. So, for example, Robert Dreyer has this idea of the Benedict Option, hmm. which means a withdrawal from the American political spectrum and a return to more grassroots and collective um, forms of politics. So now the question becomes, the question becomes, okay, who creates the conditions for alternative courses of actions and alternative futures? Well, the answer to that quite simply is the Muslim Ummah, the collective self, right? And this process of articulating alternative visions and alternative courses of action is what's meant by the word ishtihad. Ishtihad, the, the very word ishtihad connotates a struggle, right? There will always be a process of struggle. And if you look at the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, right, we find that there was a struggle that preceded the establishment of an Islamic order, that preceded the establishment of the new Medina and so forth. So struggle and sacrifice is an integral process to true representation and to creating the conditions um, for the articulation of alternative visions. Now, I think one of the essential um, steps in articulating alternative visions and in creating new conditions is that we go beyond thinking as a minority and begin thinking as a global majority. So when we think of Muslims in America as a political unit, we are falling under a minority complex. Right. So the geographical borders of America become borders of the mind. Mm. It limits our ability to think about the future and to think about the present. But when we begin to think as a global ummah, as a global majority, the global Muslim North and the global Muslim South, then we are able to think about how to create new conditions and so forth. Yes. And I think an integral step in doing so is to begin thinking about how do Muslims gain representation on the global level. And yes. this is where I think it's essential that we recall certain ideas like the caliphate, for example. And we begin to think about key questions. What does it mean to belong to an ummah and at the same time live in the United States? Um, the last thing I'll say about this is that we're, we're talking as though the secular order in the United States and the, uh, the political spectrum is this inevitable order that we cannot go beyond and it is impossible to think beyond. The reality is that this political spectrum is, is uh, crumbling. And again, this goes back to the point I made earlier. That's precisely why we see the rise of populism and we see the rise of ra radical left-wing politics. Because even people in the West, non-Muslims, are beginning to lose hope in, um, in the political spectrum. A lot of and mistrust, I mean, just, yeah. just look at just look at the the debates within the Democratic camp, within the left-wing camp, when the presidential elections were going on, right? People were arguing that we should vote for Joe Biden, not because Joe Biden has some kind of vision and alternative project, but because Joe Biden is the lesser of two evils. So even within the left wing and within the right wing, there's this growing sense of disenchantment and the sense of hopelessness with the existing political spectrum and so forth. So you mentioned something. I'm just going to ask one mm -hmm. question. Look, I what you said about number one, just starting off with Muslims have to think uh, as a global ummah first to not confine themselves to political borders or geographical borders. I'm with you 100 percent. Right. But you mentioned something that the change and the conditions have to be made and only the ummah can make those conditions, right? Mm -hmm. But I can say that um, what ummah, what are you talking about? We're not even united. Nobody cares for each other. No ummah has anybody's back. We've been talking about Palestine, Palestine, Palestine. Muslims are surrounding, you know, Palestine, Muslim countries. Uh, Muslims in America don't care too much, you know, obviously we have family ties and all that stuff, but what's happening politically in the Muslim world and what's happening, you know, all everywhere is, what do you mean? There's no unity, right? We've been hearing that for the past 30 years. Muslims are not united. Nothing's going to happen, right? So mm -hmm. which ummah, which global ummah is going to make these conditions for this to happen in the first place when, you know, we're divided amongst, you know, almost 100 countries, right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, so how how would you address that? So I mean, I would disagree, right? I would disagree. I think that we are witnessing the emergence of a global political Muslim solidarity with this idea of the Ummah, right? Um, and actually, you know, Brzezinski, who is one of the ideologues of the American empire, actually warned about this when he said that the, the, the greatest threat facing the American empire is the emergence of a global political consciousness. And like I was saying with the Rand analyst, Stephen Simon, mm-hmm. warning that um, of Ummatitis, this idea of a transnational body that Muslims are increasingly um, associating with and identifying with and so forth. So the question is not whether or not the idea of the Ummah exists. The idea of the Ummah most certainly exists. Of course, yeah. And it is stronger than the national bonds, right? And it is becoming stronger and stronger. The problem is that we don't have a structure in global politics that can represent the interests of the Ummah. And that's why I think when we talk about Muslim visions, we cannot be ambiguous. I think we need to be very concrete. And this goes back to what I said earlier, that we we need to begin thinking very seriously about ideas like the caliphate in global politics as a form of representation on the global level, on the level of international politics. I think this is the level that we need to begin thinking about. Yeah. And this is a collective effort. This is not going to drop out from the sky. This has to be a collective effort effort and this is not foreign to muslims ishtihad is part of our tradition so part of ishtihad collective ishtihad is beginning to think about okay how can you recall the caliphate as a structure which represents um global muslim solidarity yeah and i mean just for even the listeners i know a lot of people because of you know just in my own circle and a lot of people that communicate with Unfortunately, the word caliphate has been tarnished, and it's just the concept of Islamic State has been tarnished oh, yeah, because of, of because ISIS. of because of ISIS and Daesh and stuff, right? Yeah. But what we're referring to is obviously, and I think Ali, if I speak on your behalf, also is is a, a, an obvious and Islamic, obviously, but in in a sovereign recognized entity by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That's mm-hmm. in essence what it is. We're talking about just don't let the word caliphate distract you or the word Islamic State. I mean, words are just words. That doesn't matter, right? But mm-hmm. in reality, it it is that it's a sovereign recognized entity, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is one of the purposes he, he created us for right so mm-hmm. it's don't be distracted again by any of these by any words it is what it is right that muslims uh in our deen its purpose was to make sure that allah's deen is his name is raised and that his deen is reign supreme in this in this world right every everybody can have their own ideas of what's supposed to be successful muslims we believe as as muslims it's our aqidah that we love allah and whatever allah wants us to do has to be at the utmost highest respect, right? And uh, even on a governance level, not just on a spiritual level, right? Um, but since we talked about um, an alternative, and you obviously gave us an alternative, is there something other than, yeah, Muslims should be thinking globally in, as an ummah, but even how how is that done in the first place, right? Or or how and also how um, just how do, how, how do we mindset? well how do we bring out instead of without a coup being involved how do we bring this this caliphate into the discussion um without getting laughed off the stage because yeah. that's what more the most likely outcome would be that you know when you talk about this with uh with any kind of world leader or someone of, of with power you know you you're always getting risking that you know where you're trying to bring about in their words, the 14th century or whatever, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's what they think. So. So I think, okay, I think, you know, one of one of the things that I'm sensing is, again, this goes back to this sense of inferiority, mm-hmm. the sense of hopelessness, this idea that a caliphate or that global Muslim representation is impossible. And again, just to reiterate, this is precisely how power operates. Power operates at the level of cognition, your ability to think about the future and the present, and it also shapes your very sentiments and your desires. Now, I would argue that 
what we are witnessing is 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 not the the permanence of the global secular order the arab spring demonstrated to us that it is unsustainable in the muslim world right so i'll, I'll tell you something you know when i was living in lebanon right and um active you know for 10 years with islamic activist movements and etc even then living in the muslim world for us the idea of a revolution starting in egypt and in syria and in libya was unthinkable but alas what happened we witnessed revolutions in the muslim world so what we had deemed to be impossible what the secular order had deemed to be impossible proved not only to be possible but proved to be inevitable now the problem, uh, in my opinion, is not that there's no sense of ummah. I think there is this collective energy that exists throughout the Muslim world. There is this collective energy. The problem is that this collective energy is not being channeled uh, towards a coherent, strategic um, project. So when we think about the idea of the caliphate, or when we think about the idea of the ummah, we need to begin thinking on strategic terms. We need to begin thinking of concrete goals and so forth. And this is not a uh, 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 this is. I mean, I mean, g given given the the direction of politics in the Muslim world, this is a strategic necessity. It is not something that we can forego. But someone can say to you, and again, all these things that I'm saying, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, mm -hmm. okay? So don't be annoyed by me personally. It's just, you are kind of annoying, Shia. Okay, it's okay, though. We're, <laughs> as long as Ali thinks I'm not annoying, that's all that matters. No, 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 you're We're, not annoying. <laughs> what a nice guy. No, 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 you're not annoying. What a sweetheart. Dude. You'll, feel, you'll, you'll feel otherwise after a few more episodes with us. <laughs> Uh, which is going to be our next pitch that you join us permanently, but I don't know. But, anyway, <laughs> but anyways, so um, another thing that we hear and someone can say if they the way they understand the world is um look the ummah the people the civilians yeah of course they want islam but mm -hmm. the people who actually have power they're not going to be okay with this their loyalty is to somebody else in order for them to stay whatever right whatever condition they mm -hmm. have they've made uh contracts with people which they're okay with whatever happening so at the end number one uh, first point is yes, the ummah, the Muslims and uh, uh, civ the civilians, yeah, they'll be cool with you, not the leaders. That's the first thing. The next is, bro, what you're asking for is going to be inevitable bloodshed, and look at the result of what happened in Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. This whole uprising happened here, Libya, Syria, Syria is still happening, and all this, oh, and yeah. we have got nothing, right? And and, we... and, and just with people who've uh, recently seen with Ukraine, people are saying that, yep. oh well, look what will happen to your khalafa. You'll be kicked out of the Swift Bank uh, yeah. system, you know. Yeah. What are you going to do about money? Swift payments. Nobody's going to want to handle. How are you going to handle all these sanctions? Look how Russia is getting crushed. So, please go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. It. That's all I had to say. So I'm saying that now. These are now again. The idea is beautiful, but now we want to, you know, on air. We want to, we want to try to, you know, criticize it as much as we can. You know, even though mm -hmm. I, I'm in full agreement oh. with you, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. So I mean. Uh, I think we're digressing a bit from the the main topic, right? Which is the the Muslims aligning with the left and the right in the West. Yes. So a proper discussion of the caliphate and how to bring about the caliphate and the caliphate in relation to international politics. I think this is in and of itself um, another discussion. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. And I would I would advise you to read um, Who Wants a Caliphate by Oumia Anjum. And some of the work that's coming out of the Omatics Colloquium, which is a new initiative that I'm part of, and so forth. Um, and the only reason I brought that up is because we were talking about alternatives. And naturally, mm -hmm. I guess the mind usually wanders and says, okay, he's talking about... And a lot of some people may agree with you, you know, that, you know, the, the whole, um, uh, uh, the, the, the right and the left and you selling yourself out and whatever the case is. But once you mention alternative, the mind just kind of goes in that direction, right? That kind of happened to me. I was like, okay, let's let's kind of go. Oh, well, yeah. But, well, what's the natural alternative to the prevailing world order? Yeah, but I so think what you mean by this is you just want to just focus on this section that that we have in the article and this this, this the subject matter of the article because this can become completely something yeah. else, though. 
Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, to do to do justice to the topic. Yes. Uh, yes. To do justice to the topic of the caliphate in global and political relations, I think, is in and of itself um, another topic that requires a lot of, uh, which requires a, a separate session. Yes. Um, there's one excellent text that I would recommend actually that I was using uh, in preparing for this lecture for this for this uh, session is um, Islam and the Political by Amr Thabit and so forth. So uh, in terms of trying to think about a global Islamic political order and so forth. And like I said, I would I would refer to Omi Al-Anjam's piece, Who Wants a Caliphate, um, with Yaqeen, with the Yaqeen Institute, um, mm -hmm. to, to begin thinking about, about questions of this sort. Awesome. Uh, so in closing, your, your article talks about uh, there being a fine line between engagement and subordination. Um, what, were you, what, what do you mean by that? Um, how, do, how could engagement, can engagement become subordination? Is there, what are some pitfalls of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, okay, so the difference between engagement, so in order to go to shift, right, from subordination to engagement, um, what does that mean? Engagement as opposed to subordination means when you can positively and proactively engage with other ideological camps. And this is what the Muslims did, for example, when they were engaging with Greek philosophy, Hellenistic philosophy, Roman political culture, and so forth. Now, how do we go about from a state of subordination to a state of engagement, a state of positive engagement? Well, you can only do so when you identify your own set of commitments. So the way it is packaged today is that the left wing has their own cluster of commitments and the right wing has their own cluster of commitments. Each one has its own ideological framework. Each one has its own strategic framework. Now, in the absence of a Islamic strategic framework and an Islamic normative reference, an Islamic intellectual framework, then it is only inevitable in the absence of these frameworks that instead of engaging with the left and the right, we're going to be subordinated to the left and the right. Again, because there is no vision, right? There is no point of reference. There's no frame of reference and so forth. So I think part of ishtihad, the ishtihad that we need today is to begin to think about, okay, what is the identity structure of Islam? What are the commitments of the Muslim? What are the policy preferences and what are the strategic preferences of, of the Muslim? And I think ishtihad, you know, is literally part and parcel part of this process of identifying those commitments and identifying what is strategically in favorable um, to the Muslim world. Yeah. Um, is there anything uh, in closing that you wanted to... Uh, discuss that uh, we didn't talk yet on the show regarding yes of course this article is there something that um because i really really want people to read it you know after having this backdrop but this is a really 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 important article i think for muslims just to understand where they are you know what i'm saying sometimes we don't know that the very framework that we're operating from um is not going to bring us any type of progress or mm -hmm. what type of progress would have, and what is progress right i think essentially what also you're referring to in here is a certain type everyone has this need for to, to progress right mm -hmm. exactly so I, I think okay one of one of the key things that we need to reclaim a key re, a, a key um, uh, uh, fact about what it means to be a Muslim right or more so what it means to be a human being so human beings are distinguished from other beings because they have the capacity of choice. They have the capacity to choose. So John Paul Sartre, who is a French existentialist, when the Germans invaded Paris, he came out with an article which started with the lines, never have we been more free. Why? Hmm. Because man still has the capacity to choose to resist. Now in Islam, we have this alter this in, in terms of the the conceptual similarity to the idea of freedom. We have the idea of ikhtiyar. Ikhtiyar means choice, right? So God has given us the capacity of choice, 
precisely so that we can take up a particular vocation, which for the Muslims is being a witness to mankind on to earth. And the word ikhtiyar, the word ikhtiyar is not unconditional freedom. The word ikhtiyar is bound. The root word is uh, is khir, right? So when we think about choice, we are bound with the idea of what is good, what is just, and so forth. So what we need to remember is that at every point in time, under occupation, under subordination, under fitna, under oppression, um, we have the capacity to choose. We have the capacity to choose alternative futures. And when we strip ourselves of the capacity to choose, we are stripping ourselves of what it means to be human in the first place, the capacity of choice. And what we are left in is a state of fitna. We know through the Quran that fitna does not just refer to al-qital, which refers to uh, uh, fighting or, or, or oppression. Fitna refers to the internalization of certain images, the internalization of domination and so forth. So the only way for us to escape fitna, whether it's Muslims in the West or Muslims on a global level, is to reclaim our capacity to choose alternative futures and to have the audacity and the boldness to think about alternative futures and to think about alternative courses of action. Yeah. yeah. And I think that unless we do so, we are riding a sinking ship because yeah. the existing political spectrum as it stands and the existing secular order as it stands is unsustainable. So we can choose to jump off the ship, right, and sit at our own table, or we can continue sitting at a table or a ship that is in the process of sinking. 100%. That, that's just um, so spot on because that's our, our God-given gift or, or the, the, our capacity to choose you know, and people can make the argument that, you know, kind of consciousness itself is the ultimate gift that was given to man. But mm -hmm. but ch choice is a, is a consequence of that of that consciousness. Mm. Right. And naturally. And yeah. by us limiting our ability to choose within, you know, the left wing or the right wing. Well, then you're you're doing an injustice on yourself. You're oppressing yourself by mm -hmm. giving your yourself only two different choices that's very true mm -hmm. so i mean it's definitely something to think about uh, for us and our listeners um i i really thank you ali for coming on the show this evening i know mm -hmm. we had some problems uh, getting the show started very early and you had to wait patiently but and i yeah, thank you so much for for enduring it and being patient with us yeah but it's always a gift having you on man it's my honor to be on and what was the name? Of, sorry, we mentioned that there was a last thing, the other article that that's no, coming out. The, no, no, he's uh, part of this uh, new initiative. Um, no, he said there's going to be another article too that's that's going to be releasing soon, right? So there's there's two articles, um, and I'll be posting these both. On uh oh, oh, you went mute. Oh, sorry. you you dis you disconnected. Your. I think you. Hit I something. think I think you pulled up a, a cord or something while you were adjusting your microphone. Just plug in at whatever you were. Am I? Do you yes, hear me? Yep. Yes, yes. There you are. So there's two articles that are coming out. The first is called "The Idea of America Is Dead." Mm -hmm. So it talks about the ways in which the existing political spectrum in the United States and global American leadership is crumbling, and that we need to begin thinking of alternative global archetypes because the very idea of America and the American project is no longer sustainable. That's what Henry Kissinger meant when he said that the world is on fire. Right. He was very accurate in his description. Um, another article coming out is called The Great Fitna. So I, I explore in detail the ways in which uh, Muslims are subordinated to a secular order and how to begin to think beyond that secular order. Because essentially, uh, the left and the right are both expressions of a secular order. So what does it mean to think beyond the secular order? Hmm. And what can we kind of expect those drops, those releases? Uh, I think within the next coming weeks, inshallah. Cool. If you want, you can just post the Twitter feed, inshallah, and I'll be posting them there. Okay. Inshallah. Awesome. Very nice. Awesome. And uh, you're also now part of the new initiative, Colloquial something. Omatic Colloquium. Om Omatic, Omatic Colloquium. Colloquium. Yeah, I'll, I'll wow. put that in the episode description. That I saw some other brothers who are also part of that effort um, uh, post something on their Facebook feed uh, related to it. So I'm really curious to check that out. And uh, I... 
I think many of our listeners will enjoy Inshallah. reading reading that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much, Ali. Um, for oh, our you. listeners, uh, please help us out on patreon.com backslash the Mad Mom Blokes. Uh, every little bit goes a long way. We don't want a majority of your donation. We only want a sliver. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? Like, of course. 5%. Five percent of your overall donation, donations that you give, you know, you, oh, so yes, let's just yes. say you're giving a thousand dollars. They're gonna say five percent of your wealth. That was no, 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 no. <laughs> That's double the <laughs> cut, bro. At least not. <laughs> at least not yet. No, but um, a sliver of your donation should all, always go to yeah. you know Muslim content creators. I know that's how I allocate mine. Yeah. You know, and think of it as investment. Don't think of it as a donation. It's yeah. an investment, right? Yeah. You're you're helping. Uh, a good cause for whatever it is that you're giving but you, whether you're donating to the Mad Mamluks or anywhere else yeah. don't think of it as a donation think of it as an investment right yeah alright folks that's it for us this evening we'll see y'all next time Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum